Hello there. Nice to see you. Take your time. Right. Are you? Hi, Hello there. Bill Fox. Hi. Hi. Financial tape fails, those others are ours, and that means there will be a tape available for you if you miss anything out of the office. And Mr. President, although there is no prearranged communique for this, uh, you must have one or two things you'd like the summit to uh, take note of. What's of particular interest to you and the United States that you'd like some sort of agreement on all of this? Well, I think there are a number of things that we intend to talk about based on the uh, extensive consultations that have been going on in the past year with OECD and IEA, the International Energy uh, Program. Talks in COCOM, that, and things of that kind. But um, the issues, I think, number one on the list would be the economy and how we can continue to uh, get convergence so as to speed the recovery and to make it uh, worldwide because it is a worldwide recession. Uh, I think the problems of exchange rates. What kind of a statement would you like to see on the economy? Well, I would like to see it reflect the optimism that from my personal contact with uh, uh, these other heads of state in advance of the meeting that we've, uh, that I've heard them express as well as ourselves, that we are on the way out. I think the United States probably is a little ahead of, of several of them on their recovery, but uh, you know, that's to be expected. That, that sort of thing can vary. But the... Uh, I think a reasonably optimistic statement about our belief in our ability to handle this and to obtain a lasting recovery without any resort to the quick fixes of the past. Uh, what would that do, an optimistic statement? What would be the result of that? Well, I've always believed that uh, <clears throat> there is a psychological factor in uh, things of this kind. If you have people feeling pessimistic, uh, you're going to find a, a hold back on investment. You're going to find people uh, basing, and businesses basing their actions on uh, mistrust of the future rather than confidence. Mr. President, in taking this uh, more free form approach to the actual uh, uh, transactions down there, Aren't you running a uh, risk of, of missing an opportunity? I mean, at, for instance, on, on the energy uh, front, uh, at, a, at a time when uh, oil is not in short supply, couldn't the U.S. and its allies be looking for more concrete things to do in unison that would uh, uh, help head off future energy shortages uh, insofar as uh, import uh, duties or other measures? Well, when you discuss the whole subject of, of energy, and as I say, this is just one of a number of issues that I think there uh, that we've been discussing uh, at the ministerial level over the year, I think, yes, uh, there are a number of facets to it. Long range, um, the matter of uh, nuclear non-proliferation, uh, to see that we're all uh, together on this, and conscious of the threat that this could be to the other things we're trying to achieve in world stability and, and peace. Um, so it's, and that's the idea of this, that you, you have some issues that uh, we know our ministers meet on and talked about, but, <clears throat> but to put them out there without some pre-structured meeting that's going to follow a definite agenda <coughs> And uh, who knows, there may be someone that's, uh, some, one of them that's got some particular questions that they, that they think uh, should be taken up by the, the group. It'll be that kind of a discussion. Or do you have discussion. any of those? What? Do you have any of those specifically? Uh, 
No, I, well, I, would, I would like to um, re-emphasize the importance of non-proliferation. Mr. President, in uh, preparing for this summit, I'm told that you went to extraordinary lengths to brief yourself on the issues and to become well-versed in the complex questions of international economics. That being the case, I wonder whether in this whole process of preparing for Williamsburg, uh, your thinking about any of these issues has undergone any change, any modification, or uh, new subtleties that you may not have had before? No, the, <clears throat> much of the extensive preparation is because uh, being the host, uh, I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to be the, uh, well, you could call it a moderator or, or whatever. And uh, uh, this has been a case of talking to the people that have been in the various meetings all the discussions that have been going on the so that uh, I won't, in the series of meetings, uh, uh, overlook anything. Mr. President, uh, you decided to put high uh, tariff on imported motorcycle in April. Does it mean uh, the change of this administration's free trade policy? The motorcycles. Motorcycles. Oh. Yeah. No, this, is, this was a thing that's particularly under American law where there is a particular industry in an emergency situation and that uh, must have help in order to make itself able to be competitive. It is a temporary situation and uh, our law provides for that and that's, that's what that was all about. Mr. President, do you see any major differences with the European laws that need to be solved before you can come through to a successful conclusion to the summit? Need. Any major differences with the European allies that need to be resolved at the summit before you can have a successful conclusion? Now, I don't, um, I don't foresee uh, anything really of a, of a confrontational uh, nature. The, uh, I, I'm sure there are going to be differences of opinion and, and approaches and so forth, but um, uh, I have been in communication with all of the participants uh, in fact, uh, several exchanges uh, between each one of us. I am having individual meetings with each head of state as they arrive. One uh, uh, just later here this morning with uh, uh, Prime Minister Nakasone of Japan. Uh, yesterday I met with uh, Fanfani of Italy. I will meet, be meeting with the others uh, individually. And uh, I have to say, I. I would be very surprised if there is any... Uh, There's one, one, one particular point that some of the Europeans are very worried about, which is um, U.S. attempts to put further controls on the onward export of American technology to the Soviet Union. And a member of your administration the other day said very clearly that if the Europeans are not prepared to accept these American controls on their territory, that the U.S. will have to cut off the flow of American technology to Europe in the first place, and I wonder well, what the position Now, this is legislation that is presently before the Congress, and uh, uh, it is undergoing <coughs> changes, and we've registered uh, our feelings with it, and the uh, only matter that, uh, that could possibly uh, be considered in, in what you just asked about is uh, nothing but our own uh, provisions about national security. And uh, I can't comment further because, as I say, this is legislation that has undergone a number of changes so far and is still in that process. And uh, now you wouldn't, I'm not, you I'm wouldn't not going envisage. to get caught about an <coughs> apple may turn out to be an orange. You, you wouldn't envisage a situation in which your national security would mean that you needed to cut off American technology exports of certain goods to, to Europe. I, I can't see this getting to anything at that point. I think early in the legislation there might have been some things that uh, went further and uh, we registered our protest about them. Mr. President, given the uh, general concerns about protectionism, would you consider, as has been suggested by uh, the former French President uh, Giscard d'Estaing, that the summiteers sign a formal uh, communique uh, not to introduce in any, uh, in the next two years, any new protectionist measure or any new uh, trade restrictions, sort of a formal document to 
Nej, för. Uh, I, I got distracted there with that. <laughs> 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 given the general concerns of protectionists, and you stated that uh, any bill that any comes from Congress, for example, uh, you, will, you will veto, but uh, would you be prepared, given the realities of high unemployment here and the fact that next year is an election year, to sign a formal communique saying, right, no more no document with any further restrictions or trade tariffs will be signed. In the well, now this is something that I'm sure is going to be uh, a matter of discussion based on my own communication with all of them. I think from these conversations that all of us uh, are going to be on the side of uh, not only uh, resisting uh, protection and protectionism, but looking into uh, uh, where it presently exists, how much we can do to uh, to lessen it. Uh, in fact, I found a agreement uh, among everyone that uh, this is not the way to go. That the more we can go toward free trade, the better off we'll be. Well, supplementary to that, given the uh, the interdependence of the Canadian and American economies, it's uh, being discussed again in Canada. The question of totally open free trade between the two countries, uh, no restrictions of any kind on anything. What do you think of that idea? Well, sort of a North American economic union. You're asking me in advance of the uh, <laughs> of the discussion. I'm I'm going to be very anxious to uh, or interested in uh, all of us laying out our views on this because, as I say, I think that basically all of us are agreed that we're opposed uh, to protectionism. Mr. President, uh, are you going to discuss uh, the uh, political issue like <coughs> INF deployment? And the Soviet is saying that, that they will deploy INF in the Far East after accepting the, uh, to uh, withdraw from Europe. Are you going to negotiate uh, on this issue with Soviet uh, rather than uh, on global basis rather than uh, regional basis? We would like, of course, the original proposal we made, but the ultimate answer to this would be an end to those kind of missiles on both sides. If we have to take an interim step, uh, we also uh, would hope uh, that it would be global uh, because uh, many of the missiles we're talking about are mobile and just uh, driving them over someplace else uh, doesn't mean they can't <laughs> be moved back. Um, this may have to, as an interim solution, uh, result in uh, restriction on numbers uh, as we ourselves have, uh, have said in, a, in an interim step we're willing to go to. But we're very conscious of uh, the threat to, to Asia uh, in them being uh, simply moved that way. And yes, this will be a consideration of ours. Mr. Is this, President, is this going back to economic... Uh, can I follow up, Mr. Sure. This means you won't insist, you may not insist on on not uh, allowing those mobile missiles to be moved towards Asia? Uh, Lou, you're getting into... George. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, George. We all that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that. I've known each other too long. Why did I... Uh, Two make powerful papers. What? Two the, powerful papers. <laughs> yes. Um, the, um, I know why I did. In the first briefing that I had said that he was going to be in here. <laughs> um, you're, you're getting into an area that is very difficult for answers at this time because we're getting into the area of <clears throat> what do you negotiate and how do you negotiate? And I don't think you can do this, uh, particularly when the people you're going to be negotiating with will have this information available to them. So uh, strategy of negotiations, what you're going to demand, what you're going to try to do, that I can't talk about. Mr. President, on the economic issues, you're, you are optimistic, and I think most of your advisors are optimistic about this economy. And I think it's true that a lot of the people from the, the other allies are optimistic that there is a recovery going on. But I think they're very worried about budget deficits here. Now you all seem, you seem to be saying that yes, you want to get the deficits down and yes, uh, it's Congress's fault because they're not cutting spending, 
but a lot of people think that if you, that, and you seem to be saying that deficits aren't, are really tolerable if you have to get them down by increasing taxes. Now, the Allies really don't care which way you get at it, I don't think, but they just want them down. Are you prepared to take a certain amount of pressure on that, and are you, do you think you're going to get it there? No, I don't, I know, but I'm quite sure they're going to want to discuss that and what our plans are. There is no way that you can cut enough in spending or increase taxes enough to eliminate the deficits. You can certainly help, particularly with the cutting of spending, because there's no question but that we have automatic built-in increases in our budgeting, which virtually have the budget out of control. <clears throat> the only way, really, is the recovery of the economy. And this is why we've followed the, the course that we followed. To those who suggest you do it by taxes, they are suggesting the thing that could kill the recovery uh, before it gets underway. You don't raise taxes and reduce the, the money in the private sector uh, as they would have us do without setting back the recovery. <clears throat> as for cutting, the budget proposal that we submitted uh, to the Congress and which in both houses they refused to consider actually would, while we will have a large deficit this year and next year, actually would have put us on a declining deficit with a projection down in the future where you could see a balanced budget coming up. But do you think, I mean, that still goes back to the fact, if you can't get the moderate Republicans because they're afraid of the 1984 election retaliation, if you can't get them to cut the spending the way you want it to, Aren't you on uh, dead center? And what does that say to the Allies when they know that the, the longevity of the recovery here is what's going to have to be in place to bring them along? I mean, isn't that, you, you can't stay on dead center. Well, but the other thing is that since our plan is working, I don't care what the pessimists say and what the opponents say about it. Let somebody explain to me why interest rates have gone from 21 and a half down to 10, why <clears throat> Uh, inflation has been cut to less than a third of what it was. Why industrial production is up, why housing is up, why automobile production is up, why retail spending is up, real income for the first time in several years is up, and increased rate of savings. Um, all of these things have taken place and they didn't just come like locusts uh, because the seasons changed. Something must have been going we must be doing something that was right. I think what they're scared of is continuing that. And everybody, right. do you not believe that the deficits are going to cut that short if you don't have a plan in place this uh, year to cut them short in the next the two plan, years? The plan is in place. First of all, our plan did ask for further uh, uh, cuts in spending. But I mean, in and place it did project that. out into the out years a contingency tax increase that they could pass now based on certain the economy meeting certain levels. In other words, the recovery would have had to be definitely established two years down the road from now so that a tax increase would not be counterproductive. Things of this kind. So we were willing to meet on those two issues, but the main thing about keeping the recovery going, and this was the last sentence I wanted to add to all those other things, is the recovered economy is the way to eliminate the deficits. If, for example, the growth rate in the economy should turn out to be 1%, just one percentage point higher, not 1%, one percentage point higher than we've estimated, five years down the road, that would mean $100 billion less in deficit. Uh, if it were two percentage points higher, uh, it would mean a surplus. I think what they're saying is, is, if I can just ask one final question on that, is that the, out, the other heads of state seem to be saying, and some of your own advisors seem to be saying, that you're going to have a lower, you're going to have a slower growth rate if you don't get those deficits down. You're not going to get that extra boost from the higher growth rate. But we are doing, as I say, all three. We're preserving the tax policies that have brought about, in large part, the economic recovery. 
we are asking for further reductions in government spending. Um, we do recognize the possibility of a tax increase once this recovery is on a solid footing and, and if it should turn out to be necessary. The, all of this is going to result in reduced deficits in the out years on a downward pattern of the deficits going down. And at the same time, the economic recovery is going to make banking the biggest contribution in eliminating the deficits simply by the improved and restored uh, economy. And so far, we're leading the world in the recovery that we've made. Mr. President, um, one economist for data resources uh, pointed out in testimony to Congress yesterday that the structural deficit, which you've mentioned several times uh, lately, uh, is at uh, some $90 billion this year, even calculating at full employment of 6% that structural deficit will grow to $180 billion in 1988, due primarily to increases in defense spending, to increases in entitlement outlays because of demographic factors, and because of the indexing that will go into place in 1985. In other words, this recovery, even if it were to get us to 6% full employment, does not look strong enough to get at that deficit <laughs> projection through those years. Well, um, that's one economist's uh, voice on this. I challenge some of the uh, uh, points that he, that he made. Uh, for example, defense spending as being a major factor already on our own from our original February 1981 estimate of the five-year program of defense spending. <laughs> on our own, by finding legitimate savings and so forth, we have reduced that uh, once projected $116 billion increase over the, uh, the projection that of the Carter administration for the same period. We've reduced that down to about 50 billion. We've we've actually made savings of about 66 billion dollars. The other thing they don't stop to figure is that defense cuts of the kind that some are advocating, you're only going to get 50 cents on the dollar because you're going to lose another 50 cents, the other 50 cents, in increased unemployment in the industries that would be affected and the lack of tax revenues that brings about. Now, as to the figure on the structural, the structural part of the deficit, that's the structural part of the budget that I've been talking about, and the one where we've had the least success in getting cooperation from the Congress. They have been the most reluctant to make the changes, those built-in increases. As for indexing, as a means of increasing revenue, then, uh, for this administration that has been referred to as unfair, more than three-fourths of that increased revenue will come from the middle and lower income earners in our society. And I don't think that's a way to bring about a recovery. The indexing will, the relief that will be provided individuals, three-fourths of it will go to those middle and lower income earners. Mr. President, what further question? Uh, are you concerned that a failure to reach a budget, budget re resolution by this June on the first one and possibly a, a second uh, resolution by fall might unsettle the financial markets and build in uh, further inflation premium in, in the uh, interest rates? I don't think so. I really don't. I think they understand. They have seen out of one house come a budget proposal that would increase deficits tremendously. Uh, out of the other, they've seen something of an effort at compromise. If you envision the normal legislative process of trying to get together on those two, you come down to a budget resolution that does mean increase to the deficits. 
And uh, yet it is not binding as far as the executive branch is concerned, and I think that the financial markets understand what I have said repeatedly, that I will use a veto on both appropriation bills or any proposals on tax bills uh, to prevent uh, prevent this extravagant budget busting or this uh, wasteful spending to go on. But doesn't that mean, Mr. President, that effectively speaking, for the balance of this of this term, your first term, we are, a lot of us are assuming, or from your viewpoint, that you're not going to be able to make any kind of breakthroughs on entitlements or any other kinds of major changes so that for the next 18 months it's just going to be this guerrilla warfare over this veto and that veto and that you, can, you will not be able to make a dent in the deficit? No, I believe we can make a dent in the, in the deficits. With the veto process. I have had a letter from each house with pledges to me regarding the sustaining of some of my details. <clears throat> and uh, I think that the same process that led us to a bipartisan agreement on how to salvage the Social Security program, the same bipartisanship that has brought about uh, the victory with regard to the MX missile, I think there are enough people up there in both parties that want bipartisanship and that want to find a solution to these problems. Could I get back to the Williamsburg summit? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mitterrand, the, the French uh, president, has said uh, recently that he thinks he might just as well stay at home. Uh, he's also said that if he doesn't get satisfaction, particularly from the United States, on exchange rates, intervention, level of the dollar in future, he doesn't think um, any further summits are, wor uh, are worthwhile. And I wonder what you think you'll be able to do to persuade him that uh, uh, he isn't wasting his time at Williamsburg. I think you'll find out he isn't wasting his time and have every opportunity to express himself there. And uh, I do know that our, at the, again, at the ministerial level on this very subject, uh, they've been uh, meeting at great length. There's every intention that they go forward uh, uh, on this problem of exchange rates. This came up uh, uh, at the Versailles meeting. And the result of the Versailles meeting was uh, the increased level of consultation at ministerial levels and on this subject as well as others. And uh, I, I don't, I don't uh, foresee a, a confrontation. What do you think you'll be able to say to him about the rate of the dollar, which does the level of the dollar, which really concerns him? Well. The level of the dollar really is because we have been so successful in reducing inflation. And uh, uh, this is not an unmixed blessing for the United States because we will probably have a 55 to $60 billion trade imbalance this year because our dollar uh, is so solid and so sound. It has made our export products uh, expensive for the rest of the world. Now, if they can have the same success that we've had with regard to inflation, uh, there will be a better, better balance and uh, we'll all be better off. That brings me to ask, Mr. President, whether in studying this whole thing, you've come to believe that these countries can, in fact, coordinate their national economic policies in some kind of rhythm that helps each other. Yes, I think it all comes with, and, and this we've talked about already, convergence. In other words, all of us recognizing that basically our economic structures are, are the same. And going forward in the same programs of helping recovery, stimulating incentive to investment, to increase productivity, uh, eliminating inflation, which then brings down the interest rates, which are causing concern. Um, this is the kind of, this is the thing that we're aiming for, is this kind of converg convergence. And we will find that um, many of the exchange rate problems will disappear as we get or attain that. 
Isn't we're going to have to stop there before you read that 30 minutes. So. We asked one question about Central America, <laughs> which, which is on the summit leader's mind, I'm sure. Okay. What was your well, I was going to ask, as, as far as the question on the exchange rates, isn't that going back again to the, you know, your advisors have been redefining what inflation is, and they're now saying it's not inflation. I mean, interest rates are not too high because you really have interest rates minus the expectation of inflation. The expectation of inflation is there because you got the budget deficit. The interest rates are what keeps you know the, the money coming into this country from France and from other countries. Is, isn't that going back to the same collision over the deficits? No, and it is true that when you have a dollar as strong as ours and these interest rates remain there, yes, there's going to be uh, a movement of currency. But the funny thing is, they're not helping us pay our deficits because right now the level of foreign ownership of our bonds is lower than it has been for many, many years. The money that is being, that's coming in from outside the country, the United States, is being invested in our economy, out there in the, in the private sector. So uh, they're not, as some of them have suggested, they're not funding our deficits. Still, so, yeah, I, I just, this first killing of a U.S. military advisor and. El Salvador seems to be sort of a milestone, symbolic, if not otherwise. And with the Soviets increasing their direct uh, intervention there with arms, are we reaching a point where we may have to consider uh, increasing our involvement there, perhaps even thinking about committing combat troops? 